I, you know, I look at the movie now and I'm so unbelievably grateful that I was given this opportunity because they don't come around that often for women, especially in the genre. And when George, you know, talked about it originally and wanting to create this woman who could stand alongside Max, there's, you know, the, the part of me that's been in the business for over 20 years going, yeah, yeah, I've heard that a million times and I know I'm going to end up with the corset standing in the back. I get it. I get it. And George was just really adamant about wanting to really explore the thematic of, you know, what women would represent in a world like this. And he never let me down. And, and, and George is really like, one of the things I learned a lot about from George is about storytelling and how to connect with the audience, you know. Just small details from how often an actor who's talking looks away. And while he looks away for those two seconds, does he lose the audience or are they drawn in for more? The, just the tiniest details that really became this sort of mosaic of information that started to feed our, his vision and feed our, 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 um, our performances. George would get physical with us. Yeah. <laughs> he, to, to, to create as realistic a reaction, especially if it was something that was physically occurring to the character, um, he would oftentimes, uh, you know, he'd come up behind you and grab you or pull at your pant leg or, you know, sort of softly hit you. He'd do a number of different things depending on the scenario. Can you talk about how did George Miller come to you out of all the people for Mad Max Fury Road? Well, what always happens is that um, when a director um, starts like um, a movie like this, the um, Warner Brothers would ask him, it's like, so who do you want to work with? And a few things can happen. The director says, oh, I want to work with the guy I was, you know, the last time I worked with. Or he says, no, 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 I want to do something fresh and something new and, and just try something out. And do you have any suggestions? And, and I think they gave him uh, only one CD and that was stuff that I made. And, and he, he completely fell in love with it and then I flew out and I met him. And uh, it was really funny because we, we met after I saw the movie and we started talking and then I said something like, yeah, blah, 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 and, and uh, yeah, I really like math and, and then he's like, wait, 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 what did you just say? I said, no, I, I really like math. And then so we started this conversation of an hour talking about math. And and then it's just a simple minute. It's like uh, George, you're eleven thirty. It's outside. It's like no, no, no. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. So so time. So just you know. And then like fifty minutes later, it's like, uh, George, you're eleven forty-five. This way. No, no, no. I'm talking. And then so we would continue talking and. And then it was like yeah, 2 o'clock in the afternoon and he missed all these, he's like, oh, I really got to go back to work, but let's meet tomorrow morning and then talk more. And so I went back to the hotel and I thought about all night, like what I wanted to do for this film. But that's the thing, if, you, if you're a composer sometimes and you've give, you get an opportunity like that, like the next day, you need to come with a complete plan. You can't just, you can't just say, let me go home and fuck around on the piano for a few weeks <laughs> and I'll get back to you, you know? It's, it's, not, it's not how that works. So the next day I had a pretty well that out plan what I wanted to do, which like in short, it's like, okay, let's do a big, let's do a big opera, rock, rock opera. And, uh, and it, you know, he uh, let me talk for like two, three hours and then he shook my hand and uh, he said, I want you to be the composer on this film and that was the end of it. He's an extraordinary talented filmmaker and the, 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 the nature of George is he doesn't repeat himself. He, he loves being original, but not in an artificial way. So he, he owns the material, does a massive amount of homework and studying, and he brings that to the set and he shoots it. The degree of effort that George puts into every aspect of the film means that when we see the visual effects shots, there's about 600 in the film, they're properly advanced, finished products. So that you're, you're taken into a world that you'll totally believe with uh, performances that are uh, tremendous and with an audio soundtrack that you will be moved by. Let me start by saying that George is, uh, is the mix of creative and, and pragmatic. And by that I mean he's, he's a brilliant man creatively, 
but he's also, well, now he's a great friend. I mean, I've been working with George for about 35 years. And in that period, you get to know somebody very, very well. You know, there's been some tight corners that we've got out of and some hilarious moments that, uh, if, I, if I could tell you all the stories that I've got on George, uh, which maybe one day I'll, I'll do, it's, it's, uh, it's just a wonderful, you know, it's been a wonderful life and a privilege for me to be there with him. Director George Miller has referred to this film conceptually as going forward to the past uh, and as an anthropological documentary. Um, how did you guys go about um, setting the rules and parameters that guided you uh, in creating this world of the future past? George had been writing without words. Uh, he, a concept artist and a storyboard artist, had worked for close to a year uh, three men locked in a room. So there are a lot of pictures of semi-naked women and, uh, and some poorly drawn cars. Um, <laughs> uh, but they had, they had worked out the, the evolution, the shape, the chase, and uh, it, it would amaze anyone to go back, knowing what happens to us when we do a job, uh, how we are battered by the parameters that come at us from everything from you know the wrong location or not enough money or... Uh, I wish I hadn't hired that guy. Um, <laughs> we do, we, we, everything gets changed. But if I look at it now, uh, so much of George's original vision was there. And the great thing for me is, because I'm not very good at, uh, at drawing and would have made very lousy, very lousy uh, artscapes. But George had only boards, there was no script. So we got to, we got to write and name the tribes to give them a position in the world and then to start giving each of them a raison d'etre and a history and, and a god and a fetish. And so we just started from a story for each of them and then the same thing went down to everything, to the, to the weapons, to the vehicles, everything had to have a story of its very own and we had to justify that and we were God-given uh, extra time by the vicissitudes of, you know, the show stops, the show starts. You're not getting paid for it but you can't stop thinking about the detail and then someone fabulous like Lise comes in uh, with her crew and uh, and just starts fashioning those fetishes and giving them a life of their own. In a complete dream for me from start to finish I mean in the first case I am a huge admirer of George's cinema and he in so many ways makes a cinema that I respond to like a child. I mean, he, he makes, I am very, very pissed off like, like most of my generation that we never got to work with Hitchcock, but you know what? There's George Miller, and I now can call him a colleague, and that's a huge deal for me. But to work with him inside one of his magic boxes and see how he makes it is absolutely mind-blowing and much more than I expected. I first came across the story when I read... Well, the, f the first part of the story for me was that George Miller wanted to play. I mean, that's a huge part of, of, of all of our story here. So anything that he was going to be presenting, I suppose, I, even though you're right, it's, it's, it's different from his other films, it's, it's, it's really not. It's kind of the same vibe. It's the same commitment to a kind of fantasy. You know, he's an extraordinary, talented... What I didn't expect was that all that work and all that rigor and all that mastery means that he's unbelievably fresh and free when you're actually shooting. So you're following this incredibly... St it feels like a very, I won't say strict code, but a very established code. As you say, he works with a storyboard, he works with a shot list that's, you know, been there for a while, you can tell. It's sort of, you know, got yellowing pages. But even working with that long established thing that he's figured out for years he's gonna do, on the day, at that moment, if you feel like saying, do you know what, what about that? He's there for it, and he'll go, try it, why not? And very often, when we've done that, that's what he's gone for. So it's as if all that work, and I have experienced this, a, a filmmaker I'm privileged to also call a friend and collaborator is Bong Joon-ho, who works in a similar way in that he also works with a storyboard. In fact, Bong Joon-ho works with the editor sitting beside him. So you know exactly what you're working to. And George is similar in that way, that he gives you such a structure that you're completely relaxed and free. 
Uh, yes, I was um, approached by George at a very late stage of the post-production um, with only really a, a couple of months to go to shooting. Um, so it was all a bit, uh, a bit sudden, but uh, it, it, most of the pre-production had been done. I had to just sort of really uh, try and pick it up myself and, and, and work out where they were and where they were at. Uh, one of the interesting, very interesting things was that uh, George was building his own 3D cameras, uh, which uh, I blazed into. I'd never done, uh, you know, a, a digital film or a 3D film up to that point. So suddenly there I was in the middle of it, um, which is very exciting and very interesting. Um, we were doing a lot of work still on the camera for a short amount of time until suddenly George in a meeting suddenly decided to um, to go 2D. So that uh, released us out of all of that tension of the building of the cameras. They were having technical problems as well, uh, released all of that tension. And we ended up going 2D on uh, standard production cameras. And it, it did, as George said, it kind of liberated us all um, to, to, to making his movie. We were able to use multiple cameras, uh, have more of them, and the quality was... Uh, I believe a touch better because of the uh, the chip was a lot better in the camera. Uh, so all in all, it uh, it, it improved greatly. Mm -hmm. and you had been uh, out of the game for a while, from what I understand. Uh, you were sort of in semi retirement when this film came along. Uh, so what about it made you come back? You know, uh, well. Zach, I've, I've retired after after every movie for the last 15 years. So <laughs> when you say I was in semi-retirement, yes, I suppose I was. Um, but then I'd worked with George before on Lorenzo's Oil, years before in Pittsburgh, and enjoyed working with George completely. Uh, I found him a very interesting director visually, um, and the performances and the story, the writing, uh, He's a very, very versatile and talented man, and, and we, we got on well, I think, on that. Uh, so when uh, when he had to find another cameraman, uh, he rang me, and uh, I'd heard on the grapevine uh, the problems they were having with 3D cameras, uh, but solving them as they went along, and I, I, I was keeping track of how it was going. And when he rang, it was a bit of a shock that he did uh, because it was so late in pre-production but one that uh, was quite easy in a way to make a decision to go with him and uh, help him make the film. And uh, I'm glad I did. Mm -hmm. Well, let's talk about 